So I think the whole Leia thing for me actually started with images like this of um, these c complicated belt and drive systems running watchmaker's lathes. I was like, what the hell is that? And simultaneously, like, I have to, I have to do that. But this all goes back to old Swiss power systems that were mill driven. So you would have a factory that had a mill, a water mill, like literally in a river, providing rotary power into a, a factory setting. And then you'd have all these pulleys systems throughout the factory distributing that power to, to all the different workbenches. So this is how the factories were powered back in the day. It doesn't take that much water to just create the weight to turn this. And then once you get inside, you can use that rotary power to drive belts and drive all kinds of machines. I don't know what's inside here, but we'll find out. Oh, that would be, uh, you can pound things. If it's turned on, it hammers, they crush the cow bone, made flour out of it or something. So if you look closely here, you can see how the power is coming in on the upper right there slowly. And then through a series of belts and gears and pinions, it's being um, geared up to be to run faster. And then it goes up through the floor and upstairs is a wood mill where there are saws for cutting uh, big, big lumber, which I'll, sh I'll show you in a moment. But if you look closely when I zoom out, you can see the, the speeds and the gears and pinions, just like inside a mechanical watch. And those different speeds are running up to different things above the floor or above the ceiling there in the floor of the wood mill. So that power could be used to run that saw blade up and down. Or that rotary blade. The crazy thing is they're actually uh, running the mill and cutting wood. Once electricity came along, there was already all this infrastructure for that. And there was this, they had devised these systems to distribute power at whatever angle you needed it or whatever. And that includes, you know, adjusting things at your desktop. So um, by the time electricity came along, and in theory, you could have little motors moved around, the motors were still big, the, the motors that created that much torque. And, and because they have these legacy systems already in place, they just kept doing the belt thing. And they still do it today, watchmakers, and it still makes sense today. It keeps the motor out of your face and kind of brings the power from at least, you know, somewhere, some distance from your face. And you can you can bring power to wherever you need it. So I, I kind of knew from the beginning that, that I would get into that eventually. But first, I had to understand the lathe itself. And I had to understand why the power distribution was needed. And basically, the, the power distribution is needed because you, you have milling attachments and things other than the the lathes. The lathe, the, 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 the first thing is you can use um, counter shafts, which are like just a, a armature with a pulley on it and different size wheels. You can use counter shafts to do kind of gearing, like bicycle gearing. So you can, you can take your, your motor, electric motor or, or water mill source, and you can add torque or reduce torque or add speed or reduce speed by um, using the different size spools like, like bicycle gears, basically. So once you commit to having a lathe, I think it's a good idea to think about the power from the beginning um, in terms of, you might think you just want a simple lathe, but th start early on thinking about the fact that 
you're going to have to power it. You're probably going to want to power something else eventually. So the way you lay it out matters. So a lot of the ways that things are laid out are on boards. So that if you have limited workspace, you can you can put the lay of the way when you're not using it. But mount it to a heavy board. So I went to the hardware store and bought a cutting board for mine. And then I mounted the... the it came with a motor that was mounted on... Um, a uh, hinge, basically, a plate, a hinged plate. And I've seen this before. Hinged plates can be used to adjust the tension without sliding anything around. You just adjust the angle of the hinged plate. So mine came with something like that. So I've got the cutting board large enough to accommodate the motor with the hinged plate across a, 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 a um, counter shaft and the lathe itself and and then I put some varnish or lacquer on the on the cutting board and drilled it out and mounted everything on it, um, countersunk the screws on the bottom so that it sits flat. And the the board itself is pretty heavy, which is which is good to keep it from bouncing and sliding around. And mounted everything on that, and then. It did have a cross slide or counter shaft that came with it, which is the two aluminum bars with the with the various size pulley wheels on it. So the the counter shaft allowed me to tap into the power at that point and then put the armature above the whole system that would hold the pulley wheels to distribute the belt power. Um, but then, but then you also can use these these. Um, rods and, and wheels uh, a- attached to each other to m- bring power and change the angle of power to go to a milling attachment. And then the milling attachments connect to cross slides and the cross slides are highly um, customizable or uh, adaptable in terms of turning them at different angles depending on w- what angle you want to cut the workpiece at and stuff like that. So you need the you need the source rotary power uh, in the modern times coming from your motor uh, on the back of your bench usually. Um, you need to be able to bring it up to the front and turn it at whatever angle you need it. So once I got this all set up, I took it, put it on my workbench, and then it set up the camera system around it. But the there are all kinds of interesting things you can do with a kind of small to medium-sized lathe like this one. Um, the reason I throw in medium size, it's actually small, but it's not as small as like a Bowley 8. This is a W12 lathe. So um, I... I'm going to show you some of the things I did with it when I was just trying to learn how to use it before doing watch parts. But the, the, um, now that's a little shield to protect from the shavings going everywhere since it's kind of in the middle of my workspace there. Um, but the, oh, and then I, I also had planned putting camera mounts on it. So there's camera mount on the side there. And then eventually I put cameras above it and in front of it. And this is an example of one thing. I, I, I cut the, ba- the back off of that tape M1 taper um, as a first thing. Now, the other thing is, the, it doesn't, if you buy a cheap lathe, but it's got high tolerance, then um, that's the, one of the main things that matters. Expensive lathes can have more accessories and higher tolerance but this lathe uh, this workpiece in this lathe with this collet is within one one thousandth that's that micrometer is measuring one one thousandth of a millimeter so it, it varies less than one one thousandth or around one one thousandth in a 360 degree rotation and that may be the workpiece itself or error in the in the micrometer but in in any case it's it's a very accurate 
relationship between the lathe and the collet there. And just for comparison, here's a, the same test on a live center in a three-jaw chuck that came with the lathe. And the three-jaw chuck is not accurate at all. But if you look at the, at the live center, you don't see any movement. So that just gives you an idea of like, you can't, you can't see these errors unless you have micrometers. So this is one of my first actual milling tests. I just tried milling a slot in that brass rod there. And here you can see the, the belt, you know, it's important to be able to adjust the belt to whatever tension and position you need it to drive the milling attachment, regardless of the angle of the milling attachment. The cross slide, you can also, you can mount the milling attachment at different angles on the cross slide and the cross slide itself can be mounted at different angles on the bed of the lathe. A lot of people have asked me if I'm happy with this milling attachment, and it, I am very happy with it. And you can purchase the same thing if you're interested from the link on my website on the shop page or on the milling attachment page, which has links to all this hardware for mounting the belt and everything. And um, the this milling attachment from my research is the same one that Bowley in Germany sells uh, now. And vintage um, milling attachments are really hard to come by, really hard to get in good condition, and really expensive. So this is one thing I was willing to compromise on in terms of not going vintage with it. And then my next little project was I had purchased this um, case back opener at the flea market in Neon. <laughs> And it only had one set of bits, so I ended up buying a full set of bits from Bergeon and then having to drill out the chucks so that they would fit the larger Bergeon bits. Uh, so that I used the lathe to do that. And just using it basically as a precision drill. And again, this is just to like, like start getting comfortable working on big things, try to understand what, you know, what this tool was going to allow me to do. Mm, that's not right. And another thing I did was I made a, a magnetic micrometer, a second one. So I would have two micrometers to be able to keep track of the distance that the cross slide moves when I'm cutting things and stuff like that. So by, by putting it on a magnetic base, uh, you open up the possibility of sticking that magnet to anything magnetic in your work space. And I probably should have made it out of steel, but at the time I just was learning. So I, I used brass because it's easy to work with and to tap. So you may have noticed this is actually a totally different lathe. This is my Bowley B8. That's the size of the collets. And this small uh, magnetic micrometer also works on that. So the the thing, another project I did was the cross slide for this Bowley when I bought it, it wasn't made for it. So it was riding too high. So I needed to cut slots in the the base of it so that it could straddle the, the bed of the Bowley lathe correctly. And um, I did that on the larger lathe. And th that, that's probably the main thing that's interesting about lathes is that you, you start to get into this thing of making your own tools as well or solving, you know, when so much of this stuff already exists, uh, it's not so much making things out of from scratch, but just solving problems and altering things and making jigs and things like that. So I think overall, the the, the whole thing about making things to me is like, I, I, I can't stand being stopped because I can't do something. So, and I'm sure everybody's like that. Like that's why workshops explode into um, uh, tool festivals <laughs> because you want to. You don't want to have to stop working. You want to keep working. So you want to have all the tools to do whatever you want. And then, if you don't have the tool, you want to be able to make the tool. 
So regarding the cost of all this, the W12 lathe cost 244 francs, and then the motor for it was an additional 190. And then I bought three of the smaller B8 lathes for between 100 and 300 francs each, and the cross slide for the B8. And I bought a counter shaft early on that I ended up not using for 91 francs. If you can find a B8 lathe for 100 or 200 bucks, that's great. But th the biggest expense ends up being time and all the small things that you need to buy to support it, from collets to the hardware to, to do the belt and pulley system to mandrels and arbors and cutting wheels all, all the way down to the raw metal that you're going to need as a base for actually making things. I'm including this document so you can pause it and see the exact things that I bought, but you can also go to my website to the projects page uh, milling attachment where there are links to a lot of this stuff. And then also you need to have the cleaning supplies to like clean and re-lubricate. Re and um, I, I kind of accumulated that stuff all, over time. I think for some reason I have like an instinct against wanting to deal with chemicals at all, but the reality is you have to. So you have to have like a chemical collection and then you also have to have a collection of somewhere to store all the bits and pieces chucks and bits and grinders and stock to cut and lubricants and all that. So I have like these bins under my cabinet at, at, between the lathes to, to store all that stuff. And then the two lathes look like this now with the camera setups. Um, and I'm, I've been doing more advanced projects since you know, getting them all set up with the cameras. So I've started cutting wheels and pinions or attempting to. And now that I've made this video, I'll hopefully uh, uh, feel more comfortable going further with all that because I, I was actually procrastinating because I want, I felt like I really need to show people how they can build the, build the lathe up themselves before I get into the details of how I'm using it so that it's not a mystery if they want to see how how the lathe was constructed, they can go back to this video. Um, otherwise, I'm kind of skipping an important part of it. But at the same time, the building up of this lathe took so long and was kind of so boring in a sense that uh, uh, if I would have made videos about it all the way through, I think I would have lost audience. So this is just meant to be a kind of overview that's helpful if you're getting started to understand the scope of what's involved in putting together a working lathe from a vintage lathe. And to help you do that, I have my projects pages, which have the milling attachment project and the lathe motor project and the index driver project for gear cutting, all of which are open source and just provide you with links and information on how to assemble, build those things. Ugh. Oh.